if you're taking a layoff as a novice, you really are robbing yourself because you only get to be a novice once. And uh, those those easy gains, if you just follow the program, are extremely rewarding. And so it's best if you can orient your life around training three days a week for several months at a time. You'll be you'll be happy that you did. And um, if you keep taking layoffs, regressing, and then trying to to ramp back up, you'll find that you're you'll be running in place. So so get through the point of diminishing returns. Get through the novice phase, and uh, you know you may want to maintain strength at that point, which you'll find is not really um, a real concept. But uh, but yeah, definitely don't don't miss training sessions as a novice. And then if you want to become a Chase Lindley or a Jim Clare, the guy that just deadlifted 600 at Starting Strength Denver, they are who they are because they don't miss training sessions. They make it a priority in their lives. All right, we're here today with Andrew Lewis, starting strength coach and the owner of Starting Strength Indianapolis. Andrew is an engineer. He's an SSC. Uh, he left his job as an engineer to do coaching full time. Um, he then became an SSC after trying four times, and there's a video of that on our YouTube channel if you want to check that out. He is uh, world renowned for his use of suspenders and the way he wears his belt. Um, and he's here today to talk to us about his journey as a starting strength coach. And uh, firstly, though, we'll start with something useful for those of you that are only interested in this channel for the training content. So since Andrew is a starting strength coach with a bunch of experience, we're going to talk about the concept of coming back from a layoff, how to approach that, the do's and don'ts. And then uh, if you want to stick around afterward, we will talk to Andrew about um, his story up until now. So Andrew, let's get right into it, man. Um, Give me your thoughts on how trainees should be thinking about coming back from a layoff? So the first thing you need to think about is uh, how far, how long were you gone? So I think we think of layoffs as like people, as like being off of training for three, four, five, six months, five years, you know, really, really long. But really any amount of missed training time is going to constitute a little bit of detraining and that's going to be proportional to how, how long that you've been not training. So, um, you know, you might, you might go away for Christmas and you haven't trained in a week. And up until that point, you were training three days a week, uh, making progress either as an intermediate or as a, as a novice. And, you know, you don't really think of that as like a layoff, but, but it kind of is, you know, it, it requires modification to, to what's going on. And so, um, I think we should start kind of with the basics, of course, and then we'll branch into the more more specific scenarios. So, of course, all this comes back to the stress recovery adaptation cycle. And so you are, let's say you're working through the novice progression and you're getting stronger, you're adding five pounds to the bar every time. You're able to stress your body with the workout, recover, and then adapt and get stronger within that 48 to 72 hour period. And you come up on a time where you have to take time off. And as a result, because there's no stress that is keeping that adaptation um, at what has now become baseline, you're going to start detraining. And that's, and that's kind of the basis for which we're going to see this uh, proportional amount of detraining to the amount of time that you're gone. And that, that sort of seems like a trivial observation, but I think that a lot of people, especially if they've been off for like three weeks or a month or two months or three months, Think that they can just jump right back in and that's going to create some problems and we'll we'll go through some of those examples later so kind of the the base level recommendation i have is for um, the amount of time that you've taken off the amount of sessions or cycles that you've missed you're going to go back that amount so assuming assuming nothing kind of weird has happened um, you didn't get sick you didn't break your leg you didn't uh have a a horribly traumatic experience within that one week layoff, 
then you're probably just going to repeat the last workout you did, especially if you're a novice. Um, now regardless the of, of the length of the layoff? I'm sorry? Re regardless of the length of the layoff? No, no. So if it's, if it's like, if it's like two or three, if it's like two or three days or a week, mm -hmm. then you're going to, to just go back to the other work to the most recent workout. So, um, I guess the first part, the first part of that is if you, let's say you miss one workout for the most part, you can probably just keep making advancements. If you miss two workouts or three workouts, you're going to want to repeat the last one that you did. Now, when you go further and further along, so let's say you've missed two weeks of workouts, then you're going to want to actually regress back to a, a previous, a previous amount. So let's say that up until we'll say the first you were squatting 285 and then 290 and then 295 at different workouts. Mm -hmm. You take two weeks off. Maybe you'll go back to 295 or 290, mm -hmm. uh, but you're probably not going to just be able to pick up you know, right where you lift off, left off uh, two weeks later, but one week later, you might be able to. Got it. Does this change depending on the age of the trainee? Yes, I would say so. So uh, older trainees are going to detrain faster and you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to regress even more uh, than you would with, for, for example, a 20 year old, a 20 year old male specifically. Um, you're not going to have to take quite so much time off if you're, if you're a little younger. And, and, and to be clear, younger might mean like 20 to 40, right. not necessarily just 20. Right. And does this change uh, based on the level of training advancement? So for a novice versus an intermediate? Yes. So if you are a novice, you are going to have to, you're probably going to have to regress more than if you are an advanced trainee. And part the, the kind of math behind that, if you think about it, so let's say that you have, um, let's say that you are, are an advanced trainee, you have a long stress recovery adaptation cycle that we'll, we'll just say for, for easy math, let's say it takes, it's 20 workouts long and you miss one workout that represents 5% of that entire stress recovery adaptation cycle. But if you are a novice and you miss one workout, that represents a hundred percent of the stress recovery adaptation cycle. And so the further along you are as an advanced trainee, uh, the more you can kind of just jump back into it without, without a ton of issues. Mm -hmm. um, the place where that starts to become a really big problem is when you get these long layoffs, because people have, people have memories and they remember being excited about squatting a really heavy weight. And it's really unpalatable to walk into the gym after three months and squat like 185 when you know you can squat 405 for five. Uh, so there, there does have to be a logical kind of tempering of expectations in order to not make yourself obscenely sore and, and just ruin the experience coming back and just set yourself up on a, on a, a bad course to, to get back into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at what point, how do you calculate the math on um, a layoff that's longer than you know, a week or two. So I would say anything over than, and, and this is all like really hand wavy stuff. It's not like there's not hard calculations that I've, that I've put into this. Um, but I would say anyone who's, who's longer than uh, two weeks, again, it's going to depend on the training level. It's going to depend on the age Then I'm probably going to run them through another LP. Mm -hmm. Um, especially as it's getting toward that, that month or two, um, anything beyond a month, I would definitely say you're going to want to come back a lot lighter than what you want. Um, and this assumes that you're, you're full stop. You're not lifting at all during that time. Um, you can do a lot. If you're able to lift even a little bit in that period, that that's technically the layoff, you can prevent a lot of detraining in that process. Even if it's something as simple as, um, one lift a session for three sessions or four sessions a week. Even if you have a, a three month layoff, you can prevent quite a bit of detraining by just getting in that, that little bit of stress, um, in that time. So your so advice is if you've put in all this hard work to get stronger, instead of getting off the wagon and then, uh, 
you know, getting demoralized and thinking about all the gains you've lost. Um, just try to get something and train once a week, yes. um, hit all the well, major lifts. My very first piece of advice is do not take a layoff <laughs> at all. Especially if you're a novice. If you're taking a, if you're taking a layoff as a novice, you really are robbing yourself because you only get to be a novice once, and uh, those those easy gains if you just follow the program are extremely rewarding. And so it's best if you can orient your life around training three days a week for several months at a time. You'll be you'll be happy that you did, and um, if you keep taking layoffs, regressing, and then trying to to ramp back up, you'll find that you're you'll be running in place. So so get through the point of diminishing returns get through the novice phase. And, uh, you know, you may want to maintain strength at that point, which you'll find is not really um, a real concept. But uh, but yeah, definitely don't don't miss training sessions as a novice. And then if you want to become a Chase Lindley or a Jim Clare, the guy that just deadlifted 600 at starting strength Denver, they are who they are, because they don't miss training sessions, they make it a priority in their lives. And even if you know, even if you don't want to deadlift five, 600 pounds, even if you don't want to deadlift 400 pounds, which, which you should, but even everyone if you should don't want at least 405, if, if least Rip were here, he'd say 500, but let's just say at least 405. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's say you don't want to deadlift 600. Let's say that, that right now where you're sitting, you're, uh, you know, you got your 225 deadlift and, uh, and, and you're, you're working on that and you got, um, you know, a potential, a potential thing that, that you're going to, you're considering taking a layoff for, um, you know, I, I have never, I've never had a time where I've had to do a layoff and I am glad that I did it. Mm -hmm. I've never come back from a layoff and been glad that I wasn't at least doing something in that process in that time. Yep. And what are your PRs just, uh, just so you can, um, you reinforce the point of, of, of what, well, so I, of what actually happens when you don't take layoffs. Yeah. So I, I've been training pretty consistently for, I don't think, I think I missed, I missed, uh, one workout, two workouts in the past three years. And, um, one of them, uh, one of them was because I got hurt doing something. And the other one was because I got shingles and, um, I'm deadlifting uh, the last deadlift heavy deadlift. I did was 600, um, squatting 505 for singles. Um, I just PR my press at 270, and, um, the highest I ever benched was two, it was uh, 360. But I'm I'm working back up from uh, from something from a while ago. Nice. And all the while I'm I'm doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well. So it can be done. It can. It can, it, it, it can be very carefully done. <laughs> Let it let's definitely... let's get into the specifics. So let's talk about our target demographic. Um, Middle aged man. Uh, he's a novice. He has to take a, a layoff, and it's less than a week. So let's say on his on his last workout, he did uh, squat, bench, and chins, and then five six days later he can come train again. Um, do you want this guy doing squat, bench, and chins, or since he hasn't pressed in a longer amount of time than he's benched, and the same applies to the deadlift, do you want him to switch to his other workout and do squat? press and deadlift whichever exercise was further away at the time of the workout so the second version of what you just said got it so it's not necessarily repeat the last workout if you're less than a week into your layoff it's uh it's do the workout that's furthest away from where you are right now the yeah. exercises the exercises that you've that you've missed that are furthest away from where you are right now correct so you'll you'll squat you'll squat the same amount that you did at that most recent workout mm -hmm. we'll press from the workout prior and then uh, do deadlifts. But I would also say if it can be done, uh, you know, if you know that you're coming up to a, a layoff or even just, just a vacation, just a six day, you know, a six day layoff, um, I would definitely organize that last workout to better prevent uh, detraining in that process. So I would try to end that workout with deadlifts if mm. it could be done now if it's um if, if it can't be done it can't be done like if you can't really organize it in an intelligent way that's going to finish with all of your 
your stressful work on that time, then then you just do exactly what we just said. Yep. But I would definitely prefer that on that last day, instead of doing chins, they would be doing some type of pull, some Got type it. of heavy. So what you're saying is if you have the luxury of planning your layoff, like if you're going to travel for the holidays and you can't get access to a gym, um, you should structure your last workout so that the most important lifts are prioritized uh, to prevent detraining as much as possible. Yes, because you're, you're still in that stress recovery adaptation cycle when you start your layoff. Yep. So into, the, into those two or three days of your vacation, let's say, you're still, you're still training, you're still in that stress recovery adaptation cycle. And, um, so you know, that, even like that same middle-aged guy, if he takes two weeks off, how would you then structure his, uh, his comeback? So in that exact same scenario, mm -hmm. he, he's on the bench chin, he's going to come back and he's going to squat and press and deadlift. And if it's two weeks off, assuming that he's a three day a week trainee, which if you're describing middle age, it's going to be, mm -hmm. then he's going to regress, uh, probably two or three workouts. Got it. Okay. Now, some people, you, you have to also consider kind of the, the, um, the psychology behind this as well, because you, you're, you're really walking on, on the knife's edge there, if, which, which you need to be doing if you're trying to maximize your, your progress in this, um, in this training system. Mm -hmm. But especially if you have someone coming back from a particularly stressful event, um, which vacation you know, vacation is great. It is still stressful. Getting on an airplane, being, being in an environment that you're not used to, doing stuff you're not used to. Maybe they, maybe they drank a lot. Maybe they didn't exercise at all. Seeing a family, that, getting sunburned. That's still kind of, oh, sunburn especially. Yeah, I mean it, that sounds so silly, but um, I maybe I'm maybe I'm just maybe I just have bias to that because I'm so like obscenely white. <laughs> But like when I get, when I get, if I get sunburn or even a little bit of tan, I'm, I'm exhausted on my next training day. Yep. And we'll, we'll see the comments on that one, but, uh, um, you're not as white as Chase. So you'll be fine. Um, any, well, let, any, let's, let's keep going through this, uh, this, um, deduction. I want to kind of map out the different scenarios for people. So we talked about the middle-aged novice, uh, less than a week, two weeks. Okay. Middle-aged novice male. He's, uh, he hasn't trained for a month. What would you then do? Uh, a middle-aged novice male, I'm probably going to bring him back in, have him start, have him start relatively light mm -hmm. and probably do LP, a very short LP coming back. And would you have him do three sets of five on the squad on his first day back? No, the first day back, I'd probably have him do one set, maybe two. Mm -hmm. I might have him do ascending sets depending on what it looks like. Right. Um, I've done that with people before. Um, but you're trying to, you're trying to reestablish a baseline that one is going to give you a foundation to continue and to not kill him the next, you know, during that next day. You want him to um, be able to train two days later. Yes. And, exactly. uh, and if the guy is at the end of his novice phase, let's see, he's, he was squatting three sets of five for 300 before he left, he comes back a month later. Um, you don't want to ramp him up to three sets of five at 275, even if he can do it. Right. Yeah, but he, he probably can do it. Right. He almost, he almost certainly can do it, but it, it would be to his detriment because he will not be able to come in two days later and get that that next uh, bout of stress that he needs. And he will not be happy with you because he'll have trouble sitting on the toilet. Yeah. He, yes, he'll not be happy. So let's talk about this same trainee that's an intermediate for the same three scenarios. One week, two weeks, one month. Let's say so one month one or more. Yeah, one yeah one month or more is, is going to be back to LP. Uh, so for one week, um, probably probably going to have him repeat the last cycle because at this point um, he's missed a single cycle mm -hmm. because it's a week long um, for for early intermediate. Uh, so just to clarify, if on a Monday the guy did uh, intensity day on squat, volume day on press and chins missed a week you would then have him repeat that same workout or would you have him flip-flop as far as uh doing intensity and volume on, on the particular lifts can you, can you say that one more time you so said, uh, so monday the the last day of training before the layoff he does intensity on squats volume on okay. bench 
and chins. Comes back a week so, later. Do you have him do that exact same workout, or do you have him do the one that he's furthest away from, just like a novice, kind of flip flopping intensity and volume days? That scenario, yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably, I would probably have him do the intensity squat again. Mm -hmm. I don't have a big problem with that. I think that would be fine. But I think with bench and the chins, we're gonna again want to switch. So we'll do press, um, probably volume press, almost certainly not for five sets of five. Um, even though presses are the, the kind of the least stressful of the lifts of the four um, slow lifts, I'm probably going to knock that down to four sets mm -hmm. just to reduce the stress a little bit as he's coming back. Got it. Um, same scenario, two weeks. Two weeks, same idea, lighter weight. Yep. And again, maybe de depending on depending on the person in question, maybe instead of... Um, so, so again, for presses, because the, the, the stress is relatively low, um, probably still four sets of that. For squats, if I were going to get him back to a volume day, if he is running like five by five volume day, I'd probably have him do four or even three sets for that as he's coming back. Got it. So, um, and then uh, you, so you, you have him, so let's say it's, it's two weeks, you would have him go back. Um, in a two week time, it's only a five pound jump. Uh, let's let's say five to ten pounds, depending on on when when the layoff happens. You'd have him go down five to ten pounds on the lifts, and then maybe drop a set if you're on a volume day or a set or two on on volume. Yep, got it. And then just work back up, add the volume back in, add the weight back in. Yep. And then if he's gone for um a month or more, just a reset back on linear progression. So actually, I um. There's kind of two, I think there's two ways to do this. I think, I think the most efficient way is to, is to go back to linear progression, is mm -hmm. to reset to linear progression um, the, the same way I described earlier. Now, I think that there's definitely a, there are definitely situations where I've had people, for example, on a four day split and I've run them on a four day split linear progression um, in lieu of putting them back on three days a week. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that's a scheduling thing. And part of that is um, that they've, in a sense, become accustomed to this kind of setup where they're, they, they do their two lifts, they do their two lifts, they get a day off, and then they do two, two workouts with two lifts each. And so mathematically, it's, it's slightly less efficient. Um, but you have to consider, it's important to know what is the most optimal. And then in the bounds of who you're working with and if, and if you're your obviously if you're your own programmer you need to consider you have to know yourself and know realistically what are you going to do and if you set yourself up with a situation that you just know you're not going to do it then there's no point in setting up that kind of situation the other point is still um psychology is super important right so if you and and part of psychology is habit formation so if you have a trainee who you've been able to get on a four-day split uh, on a consistent basis, and that's now a habit. It's been part of the schedule. That habit's been interrupted based on the layoff, but um, and you know you're going to have them back on a four-day split soon. You need to think about what is your highest chance of success with this trainee, and that should probably be a conversation. For some people that aren't busy, going to, back to three-day NLP for a couple of weeks might be fine. <clears throat> um, but for others, you know, trying to, to switch their schedule around to three days a week and then four days a week would be too disruptive. Well, and, and you also have, I mean, alongside the, I guess this kind of goes along with the psychology, but you're also going to find that um, the situations of the, the clients are, are all a little bit different. So there are some people for whom you have to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. you, you have no other choice. I mean, if, if you got a, um, and, and I don't work with any, I want to be clear, I don't work with this demographic, but just for example, if you had a 17 year old who is depending on a, a football scholarship in the summer or, uh, you know, for, for college, then you, you don't have the option to be inefficient. It just has to be brutally optimal um, in order for them to, to have that correct. Um, same thing with, with older people whose uh, quality of life depends on you being precisely correct. Um, now, you know, with some people who are a little more casual, who you, who you want to keep uh, that, that habit, keep them training, you might might decide along with them that you want to take that less aggressive approach. Yep. Let's um, 
I, I want to hammer the point about making sure the first workout back is not a crippling event. So let's talk about the uh, middle-aged man who's taken a month plus off. Uh, his last workout as an intermediate on the squat, for example, was four sets of five at 335, let's say. Um, sure. what, what would you work this guy up to uh, roughly? Weight wise, how many sets and reps on his first day back in the new NLP? So, if he's doing four sets of five at 335 before he left, um, he's, he's gotten a good amount of strength and he's, he's uh, presumably doing that as his sort of volume day mm -hmm. uh, alongside whatever, whatever his intensity day would be for the, the four by five uh, Texas method. So, um, almost certainly, I'm going to have him squat somewhere. If it's if it's between a month and two, maybe 185, maybe ascending on that. If it's any longer than that, I'm definitely going to bring him down to like 135, and it's going to be really unsatisfying and it's going to be a really short workout. And uh, I have to explain that that this is what it you know it's going to be unsatisfying and it's what has to happen in order for you not to be uh, cripplingly sore tomorrow. So. You know, for a guy like that, yeah, I, I might bring him down all the way to 135. Yep. And the way you manage the psychology there is saying exactly what you said and also reinforcing the point that your movement patterns need reinforcing. It's been a while. So let's just think of this as technique day. We don't need to worry about putting up uh, impressive weights because that's not going to be conducive to uh, a productive training cycle. And that reframing is a, is a really good idea, not just in this context, um, but, but reframing something that is unsatisfying because it's lighter as a technique day is, is a great way to um, kind of make those lighter days more palatable um, alongside this idea. So we won't go through every type of trainee, but let's talk about either end of the spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you have a young male, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have an older female. So let's talk about a 70-year-old woman who uh, is going through her novice linear progression, and she misses two workouts. What's the So, so let's say she squatted... Um, two workouts? Yeah, she, she squatted 110... Um, pressed 45 and deadlifted um 160 let's say so for this demographic specifically i really like using ascending sets to really dial in um where they're going to finish on that first day now you can't you can't do that for deadlifts obviously um unless you're going to have them do sets across which is not um not always desirable but uh, for, for two days, for having been gone for two days, um, I'm probably going to have him just repeat the workout prior to the most recent one, again, with the, the furthest away exercise. So they're going to uh, squat, they're going to bench, and they're going to deadlift. Yep. And I just want to reinforce the point that with this demographic, the most important thing is not to hurt them. Do not hurt yep. these people. They, they, uh, you're making them less fragile, but they're fragile. Um, it's probably our favorite demographic. It makes up a decent chunk of our trainees, um, not as many as the target demo, like I mentioned, but this is an important demographic and they're in the gym for different reasons than the, than the 35 year old accountant, right? Um, this is about quality of life. And so being conservative, if you, if you're not sure which direction to go, um, going the more conservative route is probably the right answer. What about Absolutely. two weeks? Same, same question, two weeks off. For, for someone in that demographic at those numbers, uh, again, ascending sets, much lighter. So I'm gonna have them bench. Let, let's say that their prior bench was uh, like 75. I might, have them, I might have them bench just 45 and see what a set of three looks like at 45 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it looks real smooth and, and controlled, and that, that's kind of another component with this demographic is practice hmm. because some people you have who they can come back after a little bit of time off and still have that practice while others might have balance issues might have control issues and especially in the squat that's I think that's a potentially a problem so um definitely lower on the bench and then do some ascending ascending work to really dial in where where they can go to um squat 
lighter. If they're at 110 prior, I'd say probably 90, or I'm sorry, for, for two weeks off, geez, probably even lower than that, probably uh, 80, 85 with some ascending sets. And then deadlifts, probably probably 135 for a triple. And then uh, <clears throat> same situation, one month off, one month plus. Uh, LP, for sure. How many sets same and idea. reps? Potentially ascending sets. Just start real light. Don't hurt them. Uh, make sure that they're moving well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so they, they know the movement patterns now. This isn't first day in the gym. The goal is perfect technique, lightweight, and uh, we want you back in the gym. We don't want you super sore. And this would be a good time to reinforce the value of sleep and, and protein for this trainee as well. And this idea that you've been you've been talking about where we uh, or you've been kind of probing with uh, like flipping the the bench and the press or the squat or the deadlift and the chins mm -hmm. after after a month it doesn't matter right Not, so that that's a that's a great thing to bring up excuse me that's a great thing to bring up for you know a week two weeks even three weeks maybe but a after that it's just like it it doesn't matter right for yep. flipping. Um, what does matter is you do the most important lifts. So uh, I tend to prioritize the press over the bench for my trainees, and um, obviously the deadlift is is the most important um, pulling exercise. So Andrew, we uh, we covered the stuff I wanted to cover. What else did you want to mention on programming, or should we move into your background? I want to go over some stuff. Um, yeah. One of the things that because we've talked about a lot of a lot of kind of theory and some examples, and I promise you there is someone probably in their 20s, maybe in their 30s, who is listening to this, who listened to the portion where I recommended that you go from a, a 335 squat down to 135. And that is, I, I understand it breaks your heart. You don't want to do it. You want to get back in there. And I've been there. And I've also made the mistakes. So you don't want to do that. And the way that I have found that is kind of the best way to argue that not argue this, but rhetorically approach this. And for especially the analytical people who are very upset at the idea that they're going to have to go down to 135. Right now, I'm telling you, if you look at the math, it's not that, that big of a deal. Yep. It's, it's really not. If you are, if you are um, an intermediate trainee, you're adding five pounds a week to your squat. If you're a, a later intermediate trainee, you're adding five pounds every two weeks, you're adding five pounds every three weeks. Um, you come back and, and I ran three different kind of approaches for this, a, a, a really aggressive one that people are probably going to do anyway, even though we, we talked about this, uh, a more conservative one I would recommend. And then a really conservative one uh, that is just, uh, just very slow to add weight. And if you come in, if you come back in that first day and you squat 225, and then you add 50 pounds the next workout and then 30 pounds the next workout and then five and five um you're back up to a 315 squat yep okay and that takes two two weeks and, and two sessions okay so five total sessions i would not recommend doing that that's going to make you really sore um, and especially if you go up to 275 just to, to save one workout you've only you've only saved yourself a third of a week, essentially. If you come back in, you do 135 for a single set of five, come into your next session, 185 for two sets of five, next session, 225 for three sets of five, and then just keep doing three sets of five from there on out. You add 20 pounds uh, three times, and then you start adding 10 pounds and then five pounds. You're back up to a 315 squat in 10 sessions. Yep. So it's a five session difference. And a five session difference for a late intermediate is nothing. Yep. It's absolutely nothing. So I, I implore you that if you are, if you're listening to this and you're, you're going to come back from the layoff and you're thinking, you know what, no, screw that. I'm just going to, I'm going to go in and I'm going to, and I'm going to do, I'll, I'll, you know, 295. I, I can do 295 for three sets of five. I'll be fine. Please don't do it because <laughs> mathematically, it's just not that big of a deal. And if you're even more conservative, you start at 135 and add 20 pounds for two weeks, then you add 10 pounds for a week, and then you add five pounds for a couple of weeks. You're, you're only down maybe eight to 10 workouts. 
Yeah. And again, for late intermediate, that's one cycle. That's five pounds of progress. This problem only happens with men, by the way. W women aren't this uh, pig-headed, you know. Yeah. Men, men always want to uh, uh, set new PRs their first day back, much to their detriment. <laughs> so so um, avoid the temptation, and sometimes slow is fast. If you try to go back too quickly and it interferes with your next training session, well, you've just regressed, and it's, it's a pretty frustrating process. And, and everything I just said assumes that it goes flawlessly, flawlessly. You know, maybe maybe you can endure the soreness and, and tolerate it, get good sleep and all that, and, that, and that's fine. But probably what's going to happen if you do that really aggressive approach is you're going to get stuck. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be even more angry because now, instead of taking the extra time, instead of taking the extra five sessions, now you are going back and trying to fix things, dug yourself into a hole that you have to get yourself out of. And it's going to take you even longer to get back to that real 315 yep. or 335 <clears throat> wherever you are. Yep. What else? And, it's all and that, that's not going to happen with the aggressive approach. Yep. Um, one thing I definitely wanted to mention uh, is that, which I sort of alluded to this, but a layoff where uh, you're on vacation and just hanging out and not really doing much, that's not the same thing as if you take a week off because you got pneumonia mm -hmm. or you got shingles or whatever, you know, something bad happened. You know, if, if you have that high stress, that hormonal response, uh, sickness in general is extremely stressful on the body. And so one week when you are sick is not the same as one week when you're just, just chilling. Mm -hmm. So you need to take that into account. And, and again, there's no, like the math on all this stuff is really, um, re it really kind of, hard. it depends, but, but this idea, you know, if, if you're, if you're, you listen to this whole thing and you've gotten some ideas on what you're going to do when you come back after being off for a week for being sick, take, take it a little further because it, it's more stressful than, than actually coming back and you're going to be, you're going to be diminished. Yep. Yep. Any other points we missed? Please start light. <laughs> please. <laughs> to the men out there, please start light. <laughs> you'll be grateful you did. And in the first place, just try not to miss training sessions. You'll be, you'll be better yeah. off for staying as consistent as possible. And again, if you do have to miss training, just, just try to get something in. Try to, try to expose yourself to a training stress at least once a week so you don't detrain and then have to deal with this mess of trying to come back because it is so uh, disruptive to, to overall progress. We actually, I just had a, a guy who went away on vacation and he wasn't going to miss a lot. He, he was only going to, he's only missing two training sessions. And I, you know, asked him if he wanted to try to get in a session on Friday because he was leaving. He'd normally train Saturday. He was leaving Saturday and uh, he trains Monday, Wednesday. So I said, why don't you come in on Friday? And he was kind of like, you know, like, I don't really have a lot of time. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that in. And I was like, you know what? Just come in and squat mm -hmm. three sets of five. Yeah, you're out of here. You're out of here in 20 minutes. Yep. Good to go. So he did that. Went real well. That's going to do a lot to prevent him from losing that progress that he worked so hard to get. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a trip and you can't bring your shoes, um, and there is a commercial gym near you, then uh, go press and deadlift. Something is better than nothing. A lot, a lot of times, people um, feel that if they can't get in their workout as planned in a perfect way, they should not do anything. But something is better than nothing here. All right. Well, let's talk about you, man. So I gave the summary of, of your, your journey. Um, elaborate. Well, it was, uh, 1992 in a hotel. <laughs> uh, keep it brief, my friend. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, I can't believe you're born in 92. That's wild. Yeah. So that makes you, you're 30, almost 30. 29. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so I want to hear about the uh, the decision to leave your job and your journey to become a starting strength coach and then the, the decision to open a starting strength gym. Man, it really got away from me, I tell you. Uh, I mean, I, I so I started coaching just for fun. I coached jujitsu. I coached gymnastics when I was in college, and I started doing it for lifting because I got into lifting, so why wouldn't I coach that? 
And I, you know, I just fell in love with it. It's just so much fun. It's, it's um, like, I love helping people. I really do. It, it means a lot to me. And especially like coaching 70 year olds is the best. It really is. It's the most rewarding. They, they are so tough. Especially women. Especially women. Yeah. Seven year old women are tougher than anyone you know. Toughest people uh, in the gym, hands down. So you have to hold them back. Yeah. Uh, and I love coaching those people, it, it, but it's very rewarding. But I love when I when I can figure something out and it produces the result I intended. And that's something I really like about the starting strength coaches is that that that's what we do is that we solve problems and that's what engineers do. Right. Engineering is nothing more than getting a, a base level of theoretical expertise of, of theoretical knowledge. And then uh, someone coming up to you and saying, Hey, we got a problem. Go fix it. I'll see you in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And you just got to go fix it. Yep. That's just what we do. And so that's, it's the same thing with coaching. And you this is and why it refers to it as engineering human health and performance. Cause it is, it is engineering for, for that. Absolutely. Yep. So I started coaching, uh, I started working and then, uh, I slowly, I, I decided I wanted the credential, um, I believe it was August 8th of 2015. Um, and I started working toward it and I was horrible, but I kept working at it. I got better. Eventually I started getting more and more clients. Uh, so things with my my job got kind of perpetually more stressful, and um, there there was a lot there was a lot of stuff going on, and I, I really liked that job, but uh, it it wasn't where I wanted to be long term, uh, in the context of my career, mm -hmm. and I decided because I loved coaching so much that that's what I wanted to do. Yep. And so I started started working toward that. I went to the seminar, failed the seminar, went to another seminar, failed that seminar, went to a third seminar, failed that seminar. And then I passed in Denver in October of, uh, of 2020. Are you and, the record uh, holder for most attempts? Because a lot of people get demoralized. And so kudos to you for keeping at it. Oh, I got demoralized. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that they quit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I believe there are others who have tested four times and passed. Mm. I don't think anyone's tested five times. Mm. But... Um, I remember, I think I had told you, because I think you would ask me a similar question or someone had asked me a similar question at Denver. And I said, well, if I fail this one, then I'll get it on the fifth one. And, and then I'll be the record holder for that. <laughs> so I started, you know, I, I'm still coaching out of Black Mountain Strength Training here in Coyote Falls, Ohio. And uh, last year, you know, I, I signed up to do Starting Strength Indianapolis. And it really is just, it was where I was going to take my gym anyway. Mm. The, the, model, the, um, the association, the, the, everything that came together was, was what I wanted. You know, um, I think the way the classes are structured makes the most sense. I think it allows you to reach a lot of people, um, in a way that one-on-one -on -one personal training just will not be able to reach certain people. Mm. And so I love that aspect of it that you can, um, that we can really help a lot of people uh, in a really meaningful way and in a really satisfying way too. I mean, I've, I've been to the gyms and it's it's so much fun to coach at the gyms. Yeah. It really is a blast. Yeah. And I didn't like, I, I remember Ina Koppel had said like, the gym is the book like come alive. And I definitely thought she was kind of being dramatic just a, just a little bit. And, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, oh, that's nice. And then, uh, you know, I went to the gym and it, it really is. It's like, which gym you did you visit, the... by the way? Sorry. Which gym did you visit? Uh, Dallas and Plano. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Finish that thought. Uh, yeah. And it really does the, the iconography, the, the whole branding is, it's exactly what it needs to be because at the root of this whole thing is the book. Mm -hmm. The book is the root of of all of this stuff that we do. And it has to logically extend from that. And that's exactly what they do. So I think it's, it's a great, um, it's a great opportunity as a coach and as, as a business owner, I think it just makes, makes the most sense, um, for both of those kind of career paths. 
So one of the most pleasant surprises about this thing for me has been the quality of the people that train at these gyms. The per session price to train with a coach in a group is anywhere between, let's say, $28 and $35, where if you're training three days a week, you're spending three, four hundred plus dollars a month to train at a gym, um, which means that the people that train at these gyms are successful and they, they put in hard work and they approach our life with a plan. And that's clear because they have the disposable income to afford this product. The second thing that's uh, consistent amongst the trainees in the gyms is that logic um, and a systematized process appeals to them. So those those traits result in the people that train at these gyms, um, they end up being extremely pleasant, uh, good people to be around. Thoughtful, intelligent people that, that you feel like these are people I want to be around. These are people I want to get to know. Um, and the, uh, just the vibe in the community in the gyms is, is really positive. And I mean, yeah, I've, I've been working, uh, retail adjacent for, you know, over 20 years now. And, uh, every business has a type of audience that it attracts, whether it's online or offline. And the particular audience that we attract is, uh, is a group of people where I feel like these are my people. And, and it's not just me that feels that way. Cause I know that everyone else in the room feels that way as well. Otherwise you wouldn't want to spend, you know, four and a half hours a week with these people training 90 minutes a day, three days a week. Um, that's, that's been nice. Cause it's, it could be, uh, it could be a mixed bag when you're dealing with the general public, but this, this product selects for, um, very pleasant, successful people. For sure. And they're never short of an interesting story. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything you want to add about your journey? I was curious about, uh, I was curious about your, you're now kind of in the coach development realm. So, so Andrew, in addition to being a starting strength coach and, and it, it being in the process of opening starting strength Indianapolis, um, is also helping the franchise company with coach development. And, uh, you've developed your, your apprentice coach who you're bringing to the new gym in Indianapolis. Um, and obviously you've been through the development process yourself and you're a mentor in the prep course. Um, talk to me, g- give me some thoughts on, on development. Cause when you're, when you're talking about your, uh, progress through trying to become an SSC, what, what I'm thinking about is just all of the things that, that you continually learn as you uh, peel back the layers of the onion when it comes to becoming a starting strength coach. And just, you know, when you think you've got a good handle on things, you realize you don't. And the phrase, you don't know what you don't know, is never more apparent than when you're trying to become a starting strength coach. So I'd, I'm just curious about some of your reflections and thoughts about that process for yourself or for your apprentice. I, I would say, I guess it's hard for like reflections, but I would say that the most important thing for like, I guess, advice or something would be, you have to be brutally introspective. And, and when I say brutal, I don't mean in like, in like a metal, like hardcore way. I mean, like extremely, yep. you have to be, you have to be to a, to a fault. You have to be introspective. You have to be thinking about how could I have done that better? What's, what's missing? Um, you can't just let things be bad or you can't just let things be limited. You have to constantly be asking the question, like, what, how can this improve? What if this, what if this, wouldn't it be cool if this, and if you keep asking those questions and if you're honest with yourself about what you're seeing yourself do and what you are seeing your clients do, and if you are a coach coaching another coach, what are you seeing them do and how are you going to answer those questions um, in, in the context of their coaching? Yeah, I think, I think you're spot on because um, a lot of things in life can be bullshitted. You can bullshit your way through, uh, especially yep. school. The educational product attached to this uh, cer- certification, you cannot rely on bullshit. And you most certainly cannot rely on bullshit on the platform because your coaching either gets the person moving safely and efficiently in line with the model and produces an adaptation, or it doesn't. Um, and they're, they're, since this product actually creates measurable results, you're either creating those results or you're not. And, and something that Rip, I, I don't know if um, 
I don't know if this, if he still says this, but I remember something he used to Rib used to say all the time was the starting strength seminar identifies starting strength coaches. The platform and the oral board are an identification process, a recognition process of unfounded starting strength coaches. And, and that's really how you need to think about it. Mm-hmm. They're not there to be, to be knighted into starting strength coach them. You are going to become a starting strength coach through your, tra- through your, your personal training, through your coaching, through your um, work with the material, work with the books. And then what you're already done with that, you already coach, you're already a starting strength coach, you're running your gym, you're doing all that stuff, maybe you're running someone else's gym. And then you go to the seminar to be recognized as such. Yep. And I think people have this kind of thought that it's like, well, I'm like I said, like I'm gonna go there to be to become a starting strength coach. And it's not, it doesn't work. Don't worry about, don't worry about passing the platform, worry about being a good coach. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, everything else will follow. This relates exactly to your career as an engineer. You, uh, if, if, if you're, if you know anyone that's an engineer or you're familiar with, with what it takes to be an engineer, you know that you cannot attend a weekend seminar to become an engineer. And so the same thing applies if you're an engineer of human health and performance, as Rip says, um, it is a process that requires experience. There is no replacement for experience. It does not matter how good your theoretical understanding is. You need practical experience under the barbell yourself and practical experience on the platform, helping other people become stronger uh, in order to become a starting strength coach. And I I wanna kind of follow up with that because um, as much as I've said that about about the seminar, the seminar will improve your coaching, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. It will not make you a starting strength coach, but it will improve your coaching. And every time I've been there, I've become the, the day that I leave, I'm a better coach than when the, when I showed up. And I saw it too, because I, I, I sent uh, uh, my, my coach off to the seminar to just to just to experience it and learn some stuff. And the day the, the training session that he got back to run his sessions, he, he was a better coach. Yep. He was more confident. He was saying the right stuff. He was responding correctly. It was uh, it was just a it was a stepwise uh, change in in performance. Yeah, and you, so you get to see 25, 30 people in a room getting coached in line with the model by five of some of the best coaches in the world, and um, that that gives you a point of view that you didn't have before. And prior to the gyms coming around, if you were attempting to coach on your own or even att- attempting to train on your own, you didn't really have a uh, a feedback mechanism, uh, not not a rapid one, anyways, and so. For me, I remember the first time I went to a seminar as a trainee, I thought I had things pretty well nailed when it came to technique as described in the book. And I made all the mistakes that everybody makes, not bending, enough in a, not bending over enough in the squat. Uh, and then same thing applied as a coach. When I was trying to become a coach, I just realized I'm, I'm missing a bunch of subtle but critically important things. I was uh, having skinny skinny men and, and women overextend the low back and a bunch of issues that, that uh, were embarrassing and tough to come to grips with but as you said being self-critical and self-aware is really important because if you're not then um, you're at the risk of of not correcting those issues and if you don't correct those issues you don't advance as a coach if you don't advance as a coach you do not get the credential and a a big part of a big part of what you mentioned is is having someone else to give you feedback so introspection is great but having someone who's already been through the process who knows what to look for who can watch you and go you're like this is the stuff that you're missing um it, it's just a faster learning experience than than doing it on your own yep. just so much faster so let's end on your final words of wisdom for um someone who wants to become a coach or is already a coach and wants to become a starting strength coach what advice do you have for this person Ooh. Hard to distill down into a soundbite. Uh, you can be like Elon Musk on the Lex Friedman podcast and just sit there silent for a minute while your uh, brain goes through 55 calculations. <laughs> the eye movement helps too. I would say uh, just just what I said earlier, just be introspective. Mm-hmm. Just be honest with yourself. Don't delude yourself. And get a coach. 
those are two things. But. Get a coach. Yep. And then I would add, I would add, um, make sure you set your goal and you're clear about what your goal is. So if you want to become a starting strength coach, why? What are you going to do with that? And if the why is big enough and important enough, then, then you can be an Andrew Lewis. Andrew Lewis was going to become a coach no matter what. Uh, there, there was no standing in his way. There was no deterring him. Um, you need a high level of commitment to understand this theoretical knowledge. You need a high level of commitment to put yourself through the process of getting stronger and learning the lessons you learn and you can only learn under the barbell. And you need a high level of commitment to spend the time getting to know strangers, coaching for free, putting yourself out there, being vulnerable, um, not knowing the answer and attempting to help people while you're learning. Um, and that can be a, uh, that can be an uncomfortable process. So, so if you're committed and you know what you're trying to achieve, that process will certainly be, be worthwhile. Um, so I recommend that you think big picture. What are you trying to achieve in your life? What do you want to do with your credential? And is it worth all the effort? Cause it is hard. It is a hard process and it takes time and it takes money. And your answer can't be because I want the credential. You, you can't be collecting trophies. That, that won't do you any good. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Well, Andrew, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us and your story. And uh, thank you for watching. Thanks, guys.